Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to another Sunday Night Thrive. I'm really glad and thankful you would join us today. And what a sweet thing that we get this opportunity. So let's go right to prayer and let's, uh, let's worship God together, shall we? Father, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to gather like this. I pray for a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit. I pray, God, that you would minister to us and that we could minister to you, that we could bless you, Lord, by offering ourselves afresh and anew to you. So, Lord, regardless of how heavy or heavy labored or heavy laden or just how dry we've come, uh, regardless of where we may be, God, and I thank you for the promise that if we were to believe in you and we would come, that out of us would turn living water. So, God, I thank you for those who would come dry, that they could come and be refreshed, for those who could come weary and they could be refreshed and rejuvenated, for those, Lord, who could come heavy laden and they could be deburdened from that heavy burden and be set free. And, God, I pray that this would be a time of great ministry now, please. Have your way, God, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Broken and wretched and guilty I came Abused and neglected and covered in shame I had in a good thing to be worthy of but Jesus, your banner over me is love. All of my filthy and penitent costs hung on your shoulders and nailed to the cross. I crown you with thorns and demanded your blood. Yet Jesus, your banner over me is love. So let the stars fall from their place. For I am with you, I am safe. Mm. For all we sin is you mighty to save you call every dead soul to come out the grave for your redemption is more than enough for Jesus your banner over me is love so stars fall from their place for I am held here by your grace and let my life abound with praise the answer When the enemy comes with his condemning flood Jesus, you stand in over me is love Hallelujah, your banner over 
forget because give living God up Remind me that Jesus, your banner over me is love. Oh Lord, thank you so much for the simple truth that your love is everlasting, never fading, and that we can trust that we would be held deep in it. Now, God, as we open your word, prepare us for it. Let this time be so ministerial. In Jesus' name, amen. Beloved, grab your Bibles. Hello, beloveds. It's great to see you. All right, let's go right into prayer and let's expect God to do great things. Would you pray with me, please? Father in heaven, please bless this time. Minister to us in it, I pray. Let your word have the final say. May your spirit lead us. So immerse me in your spirit, God, so that you would be seen. Come upon me so you would do the work and speak fluent us. Now draw us in, God, I pray, as we seek, God, to be led by you, equipped by you. Do your perfect work, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. I would say this time as I would any time, please never just believe me. Never just assume it's true because I say so. Search the scriptures. Let the Bible have the final say. Or as I would say, don't take my word for it. Take the word for it. Yay. Woo That's, oh, I love hearing that back then. All right. So let's kind of catch you up to our text. We'll pick it up in Leviticus 25, starting in verse 13 today. In our first 17 chapters of this book, we go from the sacrifices to the priesthood to cleanness to the ultimate sacrifice of the priesthood for cleanness, the act of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Then from 18 to 25, we have the society and celebrations, as God builds a society upon those celebrations. And then we have the ultimate celebration in society, chapter 25, that being the uh, year of Jubilee. And here's our basic standards for our first 12 verses, moving us up to this point, and the thing I've been contemplating this week. First of all, the basic standard is this. If it works, it's got to rest. It doesn't matter what it is. If it's an animal or a person or a thing, if it works, it's got to rest. And God says, as us, we as human beings, we're unique in this sense that we have a lot of other things that keep us from resting that other things might not. And so therefore, God deals with the sin aspect first, and it starts for us to truly rest and experience this being set free. It starts with recognizing our sin is covered. Then, in light of recognizing our sin is forgiven, we now then turn and do the same in, in response. We have the, uh, the right to let go. Then, having recognized our sin is covered, our sin is forgiven, and now with that, forgiving others, we receive the rest God offers. And as we receive the rest that God offers, we enjoy its refreshment. But here's been my contemplation as we move up to verse 13 now. It's this aspect of how God set this thing up. He introduced it first with the Sabbath. And then from the Sabbath, the Shabbat, he goes to the, the Eretz Shabbat, Shabbat Eretz, the land Sabbath, every seventh year. The land has to rest. And then he says, now count seven sevens of those seven seven-year periods, because every seventh year is this Aret this land's Sabbath. And then you have this really big festival of the greatest Sabbath, if you will, this here in Leviticus 25. And if I look at it from that perspective, I recognize all of this forgiveness and this return and restoration is all part of the idea of God's intent of a rest, of a Sabbath. But what stands out and has been sort of echoing and swirling in my head this week 
has been this aspect of how God set that up with that time stamp, the seven sevens uh, from a specific Sabbath, and then two, the next, in this case, the next year for this, because that's the same thing, of course, he did with Shavuot, where, or if you will, the Feast of Pentecost, where you went from a specific day and then counted seven sevens and then went to the day following, which would be a Sunday, mind you, for the, the Feast of Pentecost of the first great harvest. And what's interesting is that the day you started counting from was the Feast of First Fruits. And the idea of the Feast of First Fruits is, in the simplest sense, is you're bringing a hint of the harvest. This is the beginning of the investment in the harvest that I am confident that is, as this is, may the whole harvest be so that when I count those seven sevens, and I'm actually able to partake in and celebrate the harvest that's on the other side of that, that first great harvest, I do so remembering how I offered very much from the beginning even the hint of that harvest in its first fruits. Now, here's where it's been in my head, is this idea that you sowed, you invested in, and in sowing and investing, and you had this, this hint of this, this beginning of it, and you offered it to God, the best of it, knowing there was a greater harvest later, of your investment. And then God says, now, if that's the way I set it up, how does that relate to rest? And I realize that I'm really terrible at this. I am not a good rester. Now, I, that's no news for anyone that knows me by any means. And God, usually for me to rest, usually has to force it. But here's the, here's the thing that's been going on in my own heart through this, is this idea of investing in the harvest for then there would be this great harvest of rest if I'm looking at it in a parallel. And I realize that every day I have an opportunity to make that investment, but am I doing that? Am I sowing into this harvest of rest? Or, and the, the questions the Lord's been asking me, and I pray you would consider as well. First of all, when you get up in the first thing in the morning, are you investing in rest? Or are you investing in stress? I mean, the things that you immediately flood your mind with from the moment you wake up, is it social media to see who's going through what, what thing, what, or is it the news where now you're looking at what's the next tragedy and crisis that's out there that now somehow I'm responsible because I have the information that I had to do something with. And I realize when I get up, is the first thing I'm doing in the morning investing in rest? And the idea of resting is resting in God's goodness, resting in God's faithfulness, resting in God's provision. And then the Lord asks me, how about, let's go to the other end of the day. How about the last thing of the day? What am I investing in? Am I investing in rest? Am I now taking a look at the day in light of God's faithfulness, in, in light of God's provision, in the light of God's mercy and his goodness and his kindness? Or am I looking at tomorrow for the borrowing stress for the next day, just so that I can not sleep as well when I go to sleep that night? And I just get this idea that as God parallels this harvest where you sowed into the ground, you saw its first fruits, you offered it to God in hopes of a greater harvest that's a big celebratory harvest to live off of. I, I'm just not doing that very well when it comes to resting in the Lord. And as a result of that, I find myself more tired and more depleted and really, to be honest, less jovial. And that's, that's on me. And so I just ask your prayers about that, but I also ask your prayers for yourself to do some soul searching yourself of how am I investing in, how am I sowing into a harvest of rest? Or am I just some, somehow hoping that that's not going to happen, you know, hoping that rest will overcome me, though I'm doing everything in my practical means to really stop it from happening. Well, I'll get off my soapbox to get into our text, but at least... I just wanted to be able to kind of let you into where I'm at in all of this as of reason. All right, let's take a look at verse 13. In this year of Jubilee, each of you shall return to his possession. 
What we really have in our text here to verse 34 will be the practical aspects of living in the light of this jubilee, knowing this jubilee is to happen every 50 years. Assuming, you know, the average person even then lived, the average lifespan, by the way, was from 55 to 62 years. Uh, then, so it was, I mean, if you're going to live more than 50 years, you're going to experience one of these in your life. I mean, if you lived 100, you could even potentially visit two of these. But in that, it starts with this. You return to your possession. Now, God's going to qualify that possession here in a moment. But in Joshua chapters 13 and 19, after Israel has now gone into the promised land, in Joshua 13 and 19, God by lot allotted the land to the tribes. And the idea of it is the larger your tribe was, the more land you got. That only makes sense. It's sort of like the bigger houses go to the bigger families. But imagine this is your family plot for years and for generations and generations. This property has been yours. But now you're in a place where you're so vexed financially, you can no longer hold on to this property. God has this way of allowing you to get out of this financial despondency, but not permanently forfeit this land that God has, in essence, allotted to you. So imagine having to let it go, but knowing that ultimately you're going to get it back. And this will, by the way, free you from, or free the people ultimately from seeing rising up property moguls. So take a look at how God puts it practically starting in verse 14. If any of you sell anything to your neighbor or buy from your neighbor's hand, you shall not oppress one another. Now, let me just make clear the word oppress here, yana is the word, it means to mistreat, to maltreat, to be violent towards. In other words, the simplest term we can use is abuse. You cannot abuse each other when you're helping a person out. God knows the human condition that there are opportunists, people that will actually look at someone else's misfortune as an opportunity for um, their own advancement. I heard a story yesterday from a pastor friend of mine. Was it yesterday? Well, whenever it was. See, the, the details are more in regards to the story where a couple was involved in a car accident that flipped the car upside down. And there it was on a public street in Los Angeles, flipped upside down, the people still strapped into their uh, seatbelts. The emergency services haven't arrived yet. People were dialing 911. And as people were dialing 911, before the emergency services were happening, there was a couple people that had arrived to saw off the catalytic converter from the car while the people were still inside, unaware of whether they were li alive or dead. And that astounds me and still doesn't necessarily surprise me. Because God knows the human condition and that unless God put boundaries on our own sinful nature, we will find other people's misfortune to be great opportunities for us for our own personal gain and God says that is not this the way this works and God will qualify what he means by this abuse or as we have it here oppression you shall not oppress one another when your neighbor by the way is trying to sell you his land for property verse 15 according to the number of years after the jubilee you shall buy from your neighbor and according to the number of years don't miss this term of crops he shall sell to you According to the multitude of years, you shall increase its price, and according to the fewer number of years, you shall diminish its price. For he sells to you according to the number, again, of the years of the crops. Verse 17, Therefore you shall not oppress one another, but you shall fear your God, for I am the Lord your God. Verse 18 says, So you shall observe my statutes and keep my judgments and perform them, and you will dwell in the land in safety. Verse 19, then the land will yield its fruit and you will eat your fill and dwell there in safety. Now let's go back to a couple points on this, shall we? First of all, back in verse 15, it says that in the simplest sense from 15, 16, and 17, that you, God, first of all, very simple point, God never intended for his people to be in perpetual debt. He knew that all lending was in the shadow of the Jubilee to come. So the term that God would use, or we might use, is God pro would tell us we need to prorate that price in light of the Jubilee. 
the greater of number of years I have it, well then the greater of cost. And the reason isn't just because you get the land longer, and this is why I kind of emphasized verses 15 and 16, because you are not just buying uh, someone's house. What you are buying in the simplest sense is you are buying someone's property, and that property is money-making land. So in other words, you are in essence taking over someone's business or at least a portion of someone's business. And traditionally, people didn't normally sell off all their land, and of course, unless they needed to. So they sold a, pro a portion of their property with the idea that somebody else could take that property and then farm it for their own profit during that time. So the idea of it is you don't just go in there and gouge this person. There's no price gouging in this. God says that's abuse. And the simplest of it is, is that if you had more years where you can make more money, well, then it's going to cost you more. If you had less years that you had because the Jubilee's coming up, well, then you had then you paid a smaller f fee for the person. So if the Jubilee were in 10 years, that means you had 10 years of, or nine years, if you will, nine years of being able to work that property to be able to get some form of financial gain. If it was 30 years that you were buying it before the Jubilee, well then that's 30 years to make the property. But ultimately, that property is going back to the person who originally gave it to you or sold it to you. So you know that that's coming. But from a more broad span perspective, an eternal perspective, this is what the Lord speaks to my heart about this as I look at this. And that is that the closer we get to that day of redemption, the less important things of this world become. And I recognize that <laughs> it astounds me because, because of the heart of man, uh, for which I have one myself, I will grant you that. But then when Jesus gives us all of these benchmarks and uh, telltale signs in, for instance, Matthew 24, about the coming of the Son of Man, we look at these things more as a conspiracy theorist, as somebody to kind of run around like chicken little about the whole thing, instead of actually having this mindset, which is that when we see these things, the term we read is our redemption draws near. And we're to be looking up. And you can see the Lord saying, when you see these things, this is not for you to freak out. This is for you to let go. This is for you to stop holding valuable the things of this world when you know that you're going to be checking out of this place soon, and you better take more careful concern and be intentional about the inventory of the things that matter, which are human beings, mind you. So God says, prorate it. More years, well, then you give it more value. Lesser years, you're closer to redemption, the less important those things of this world become. And, you, and again, notice in verse 17, it says, therefore you shall not oppress. That's what God says. You, you know what abuse looks like? God speaking. You know what abuse looks like to me? It looks like when you see somebody in need and you use that to, a, to get your own personal gain and what you do is you make them worse off and you're just padding your own pockets to do so. God says that's abuse. And you've got to imagine God takes careful concern when it comes to the area of someone that's his own being abused. And I'd like you to consider that, that we're talking about God's children here. Now you want to abuse one of my children, do not expect me to be even mildly nice to you, but expect something that will actually, let's just say, leave a lasting mark upon both of our days. So in verse 17, he says, and take a look at that with me, you shall not oppress one, on, one another, but you shall fear your God and then the term that God uses over and over in this book, for I am the Lord your God. And it's been the last few weeks that God has really been speaking to me about that specific phrase. And it's just led me to this, beloved, that when God says that, when God has to say, I am the Lord your God, which we should already in inherently know here. He is saying that with the mindset that he knows that what he's telling us to do here is contrary to our natural, or I should say to our nature, our human nature. So when God has to make these statements, he's doing so declaring, if you will, or at least inferring that I know that everything in your human condition wants to fight this. So let me remind you, I, the Lord speaking, am the Lord, your God. 
though everything is like, but I want to do this, but this is what I'm driven to. This just makes business sense. And God says, stop. I'm the Lord. You've got to trust me in this. And I, in other words, God says, I recognize you don't want to do this. I recognize you have an appetite beyond this, but I'm the Lord, your God anyways. So you're going to need to trust me because if you don't trust me in this, the, the consequences, verse 18 and 19, he'll tell us the consequence of doing it and not doing it in this. But first of all, he says, because you're going to need to fear me. And the term fear, yara, is a term to mean to revere or to hold in majesty. And the idea of it is something so profound that it makes us shake. And he goes, in doing this, he says, then we will observe the term there, by the way, as as to do or to make my statue. It's God's appointed customs, by the way. Aha. And to keep the term Shemar, like guard, like Shemar from the book of Eden, or Garden of Eden, my judgments. Mishpat, Mishpat, by the way, is a judicial decree. And to perform, there's our do make, again, Asa. So here's the simple stuff. To live in the light of the Jubilee, the land is prorated so we don't abuse one another, but we do God's customs and we guard and do God's judicial decrees. And here's the simple takeaway. When I'm obeying God, I am going to care for God's children. I am not going to abuse them. I'm not going to use them, but I'm going to bless them. And that's fundamental. If I truly trust God and fear him, not just simply fearing his consequence or his wrath, but seeing him is bigger than I can trust he'll provide and care for me. And if I can do that, I can seek to bless God's own children. And that's fundamental. And if I don't, notice it says at the end of verse 18, you'll dwell in the land in safety, in safety, I'm sorry, and the land will yield its fruit and you will eat your fill and dwell there in safety. Revering God and doing what it says, what God says, ultimately blesses God's children and ultimately results in our own safety and satisfaction. And if I don't, I should expect the contrary. And what we read, by the way, is from the days that Israel develops a king to be like the rest of the nations, the very thing they cried out to Samuel, give us a king that we could be like everybody else. From the moment that happens, this stops. From Jeremiah 17, 21, 25, 11, Lamentations 1, 7, God makes clear from the time of Samuel, 490 years transpire from the time where they finally give themselves a king to be like the rest of the nations. They stop doing this and they stop trusting God to provide because now they've got a king to do that for them. And that is such a dangerous and slippery slope and beloved Maybe that's not your life. You're, you don't think you're looking for a king. Maybe you are. Maybe you're looking for a political messiah. Just let it be known. You're never going to vote in the right guy. You're just going to, at best, you'll vote in the less wrong guy. But the guy that's ultimately the right guy, he will not need your vote to come. And when he comes and takes his throne, it will be actually at the bereavement of a whole lot of people. But he will do so without needing because because our king is a monarchy and it's not a democracy and there's a great news in that because he's perfect in every way including his kindness and his goodness so the inevitable practical question then moving forward is well how is that supposed to happen how am i supposed to live off of the proceeds what does that look like because in verse 7 and in verse 12 he says you got to take this year off bro and in doing so where is that well i'm, I'm gonna eat i'm gonna eat if i'm not doing that and God now gives us the practical on that. Verse 20. And if you say, well, shall we eat in the seventh year? God knows that this is where our heads go. In the seventh year, well, then, since we shall not sow nor gather in our produce, well, then I will command my blessing on you in the sixth year, and it will bring forth produce enough, notice this, for three years. For the year that you're do, for the year that you're experiencing the sixth year, the seventh year, that land Sabbath, and for the following year as well, because you're going to have to start over. Verse 22, and you shall sow in the eighth year and eat the old produce until the ninth year, until the produce comes in, and you shall eat of the old harvest. And this is interesting because God has already set up and established this very thing in the Sabbath in the first case. And notice He keeps taking us back to the concept of Shabbat. Back in Exodus chapter 16, when God starts to introduce this aspect of them needing to do so, and I remind you, they are now out of Egypt. They've been out of Egypt since, really, since 12. It says in verse 4, Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, 
and the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day, that I may test them whether they may walk in my law or not. Verse 5 says, And it shall be on the sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. In other words, the same way that in the practical, simple Sabbath, you got more on the sixth day so you can rest on the Sabbath, God says the same thing happens here practically in regards to the years. I will give you, in essence, a bumper crop the year prior, enough for you to live off of not only that year, but the year of your land Sabbath, and then, of course, the year to follow as well. And in the simplest of it, my resting is an act of faith, a reverence in my provider, but he will still give me an abundance so that I can rest. So therefore, my oppression to others is open defiance of his care in an open declaration that I just don't trust him. So let's put some handles on this before we get into the next thing. The simplest already from the very beginning of this is again that the closer we get to redemption, the less important things of this world become because things are prorated because of the crops that are coming from the area that the property we're getting. They're prorated in light of the Jubilee. And then in revering God, I'll do what he says. And in doing what he says, I will bless his own. And in blessing his own, God grants safety and satisfaction. And he says, the proceeds, God's like, that's my job. Now, he gets to the practical in regards to what that looks like, this land grab, if you will, this temporary land grab. Verse 23. And he, the way, he breaks it up into uh, a few categories, but he, first of all, he establishes this precept first. Verse 23. The land shall not be sold permanently because the land is mine. And you are strangers and sojourners with me. In all the land of your possession, you shall grant redemption of the land. In verses 23 and 24, God says, you need to recognize, God speaking, I'm still the landlord. Now, there is a mindset going around parts of the church that says that somewhere after when Adam and Eve fell, they gave over the land so that it's now owned by the devil. Well, the Bible tells you that that's a flat out lie. David would say in Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and all in its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. By the way, that will be quoted by Paul in 1 Corinthians, I think it's 10, 26. But then Ethan, the Ezraite, will also say in reiteration of this in Psalm 89, verse 11, the heavens are yours, the earth also is yours, the world and all its fullness, you have founded them. The enemy may have made his way in and it tells us in First John, the world is under the influence of the wicked one. But God's like, I have never forfeited rights or, or ownership of this property, this ball of dirt that's spinning around the universe. And we'll talk about the eviction of all of that here in a moment. But God says, let's get something straight here. I own the land. You are in the term strangers in verse 23, by the way, is the term gael. And gael, and gael by the way, means guests. The word sojourner, by the way, for what it's worth, uh, is the word that means a visitor. God says, I own the land. You are my guests. You are my visitors. And I'm giving you this, if you will, I'm giving you this property that is yours, but I still own it. Now, the closest example I can give you is like where we live right now. My wife and I, it's fairly likely we may never own a home. Uh, And that's not in any way a condescension towards anyone who does, or even towards ourself as some form of self-deprecation. But rather, it's an honest declare that when the money comes, it goes just as fast often for other people. And it's important to note, though, that because of that, we live always in light of the fact that we live in a house that somebody else owns. Now, ultimately, especially, and I won't say where because I don't want to downplay Cayucas, but... We would have a, it would be fairly common. We would live in a place, we'd be dolling it up because it would make it our own. And then somewhere down the line, the owners would decide they wanted to sell the property. We had no say in that matter. Matter of fact, I don't, I can't think of a time where they even gave us a right to buy it. It was sort of, and I think they just recognized we just didn't have the money. So they were like, why even, why even put them in that weird predicament? But they would be like, by the way, guess what? And, and of course, in a little town like that, it seemed like everybody knew but us. So we'd, we'd literally have people come up to us, owners of businesses and such, and go, hey, I heard they sold your house. And we'd be like, really? Oh, well, who'd you hear from? Because I haven't heard it yet. And 
the whole point of it is we didn't have a say in it. Let's just say we, like it, like the house we're living in now, something happened and we actually rented out a room in the house to somebody, which we have no intent on doing, by the way. So don't send us a letter. Uh, but, uh, but if we did so, in the end of it all, if the landlord, the person who owns the land, doesn't want that person in here, we can't tell them to stay. We have a right. And in the same way, God says, you may, you may have dominion over this property. I've granted you that, but I still own it. God's speaking. And ultimately, even if you sell it to somebody else, they have to give it back to you because I still own the land. And here's the cool thing. Think about how kind that is from God's perspective. God gives the land to somebody who, for whatever right and purpose, traditionally, by the way, famine is a result of disobedience to God's word. Deuteronomy will make that really clear. So let's run that vein with me for a moment. Pull that string. God gives the land to people who are going to be unfaithful to him. The land then ceases to yield its fruit, its crop. The people get poor. They sell it to somebody else. That, those people then do, dwell in the land. They live in the land and so forth. But God's like, even though you were a knucklehead and even though you were a numpty in these choices, there is going to be a day still coming when I'm going to give you the land back anyways. Isn't that grace and mercy? Do you see the kindness in that? So God says, look it, in all of this, in the land, you're going to have to allow redemption. And the term, by the way, geula here, is the term from which we get the kinsman redeemer. That's the whole story of the book of Ruth, David, the king's great grandmother. And uh, so it starts with this, you need to recognize you're a sojourner. One of my favorite verses in all of scripture is Psalm 84, 5, where it says, blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. He recognizes this is his hotel room. And as long as he's staying here, sooner or later, he's checking out to his permanent residence and he needs to recognize that. Uh, in Psalm 119, David would say in uh, verse 54, your statutes have been my songs in the house of my pilgrimage. And, and there's a, I, I just love the idea of this mindset that this world is not our home. Jesus, of course, would say, I am not of this world. And then he would turn to his disciples and say, hey, they're going to hate you too. You know why? Because you're not of this world. But here's something that's been standing out to me, a little side note. So if you will, consider this a bonus. In the book of Revelation, in the book of Revelation, as the seals are being opened, the, there are those underneath the altar. They are there protected by the dominion of the Lord, and they cry out in Revelation 6.10, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on, and here's the term they use, those who dwell on the earth. And the term dwell there is the term katoecho, or actually it's katoekeho, uh, and it literally means those who have declared themselves or made themselves permanent permanent residents there, if you will. They have now made their, their stake to say, this is my permanent address. That's those who, that's the term for dwell here. So they're saying, how long, O Lord, O Holy and True, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who have now made the earth their completely made their their earth their home. And, and the reason that stands out is because of how much attention there is to those today who are trying to save their home. Where their whole now please don't get me wrong, I think we should recycle. I think we should be kind to this earth. It you know, the same way that I think you should be decent to your hotel room and not start throwing televisions out the window like a, like you're a rock star. But God tells us it's temporary. These same people, that same term is used over and over in the book of Revelation. And this is what it says about them. Revelation 11 verse 10. These are the ones who when the two prophets die, they rejoice, make merry, and give gifts to each other. These are the ones, according to Revelation 13 verse 14, are deceived by the signs of the Antichrist. These are the ones, interestingly enough, in Revelation 14, verse 6, it says, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth. It's like God is still giving them an opportunity to receive this. But in verse uh, Revelation 17, 8, it says about those same people that their names are not written in the book of life. And you will find ultimately there will be those who will make this earth their permanent residence and this is it for them. And they want, to, they want nothing to do with this eternal God. 
And I just find that interesting because even here, God is kind of bringing us back to this mindset. This is Revelate. I'm sorry, this is Leviticus, beloved. In Leviticus 25, during this season of, of letting go and being forgiven and then forgiving others and returning back and getting your land back. And God says, in all of that, you need to recognize this whole thing is temporary. And all of this is setting you up for your permanent home that I'm going to bring you to when this is all over. And so... Let us never forget the, how essential it is for us to cling to a God who is eternal and to keep a mindset that all of this will come to pass, be it however good and grandiose for the moment. Okay, let's get into our last area. And the last area is in regards to redemption, God's way. And we'll see that in regards to, first of all, the three different ways a person can be redeemed. Verse 25 If one of your brethren becomes poor and has sold some of his possession, and if his redeeming relative comes to redeem it, that he may redeem what his brother sold, or if a man has no one to redeem it, but he himself becomes able to redeem it, well, then let him count the years of the sale since and restore its remainder to the man to whom he sold it, that he may return to his possession. If he's not able to have it restored to himself, then what was sold shall remain in the hand of him who bought it until the year of of Jubilee, And in the year of Jubilee, it shall be released and it shall return to his possession. In the simplest sense, God says there's three different ways. First of all, you have that kinsman redeemer. And of course, that's the whole story of uh, the book of Ruth. But of course, it's also the story in the book of Hebrews of Jesus being our kinsman redeemer. Because even though we ourselves experience flesh and blood, he himself then shared in the same likewise, so that he may redeem all of us who were our entire life subject to our fear of death and release us from the power of Satan himself, release us from the enemy himself. And I love the fact that that's what God is intending to set up even here. But then there's this idea of trying to redeem yourself. Now, from a practical sense here, let's say that the little land you have left gives you enough, you pay off your debt, you can get it back as it's prorated. Remember, every year it gets less valuable until the year of Jubilee. But from an eternal perspective, You've got this problem. And the polemic happens in Psalm 46, verse 9, when it says, They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him, for the redemption of their life is costly and it fails forever. God says, if you really think you can buy your way into heaven now, boy, if you got another thing coming, you are really missing the whole point of it. And I do love the fact that God is just making that clear because he really wants us to realize that the redemption is something we ourselves cannot actually, we can't afford. There is a, a, a phrase in a, in a poem by John Donne. The, the title of the poem, I think, is Sweetest Love, I Do Not Go. And if I remember how it goes, it goes something like, Oh, how feeble is man's power that if good fortune fall, cannot add another hour, nor a lost hour recall. And the whole point of it is it doesn't matter. Even if you were to become the richest man on earth, you can't buy another hour. When it's your time, it's your time. In our last verses here, we're talking about that redemption of land, the practical aspect of it. And he breaks it down into three different categories. Verses 29 and 30, the area, the urban area. Uh, Verse 31, the rural area. And then finally in verses 32 to 34, the ministerial area. We'll take a look at it. Verses 29 and 30. If a man sells a house in a walled city, then he may redeem it within a whole year after he's sold. Within a, whole, within a full year, he may redeem it. But if it's not redeemed within the space of a full year, then the house in the walled city shall belong permanently to him who bought it. Throughout its generations, his generations, it shall not be released in the Jubilee. Well, this is unique to the rest of the areas because isn't everything released during Jubilee? Why is this not the case? Well, first of all, God does give you this. The redemption, I remind you, there was those three different ways of redemption. There was the kinsman, or there was you personally, or then there was the Jubilee. Jubilee's removed from this one. The kinsman or yourself, if you do it within a year, you can actually buy your house back. But what's different between this and everything else is, notice, this is not your livelihood, it's simply your homestead. 
in an agrarian culture where everyone lived off the land, they were either farmers or ranchers, cities are a very different thing for them. And the people that live there traditionally, that would be a second home in a lot of cases, a place where they could live to do business, but then they would still have their land property so that they can continue to keep their business going. Because I remind you, every family is originally given land. So when it comes to a city, when God says, you want to just sort of do this thing and you want to kind of become a city slicker, you've got a year to pay it back. And if not, but he doesn't say anything about forfeiture of your land, just the house in the city is the idea. Verse 31. However, the houses of villages, which have no walls around them, shall be counted as fields in the country of the country. They shall be redeemed and they shall be released in the Jubilee. Now, in our second case, you get this back. Houses that are connected to land, which is what we have in verse 31, well, all three of those redemptions apply. The kin, the personal, and the jubilee, all are available. Verse 32. Nevertheless, and here's our third, the cities of the Levites and the houses of the cities of their possession and the Levites may redeem at any time, even if they live in a city, and that reason is God is assigning them those places, and if a man purchases a house from the Levites, then the house that was sold in the city of his possession shall be released in the Jubilee, for the houses in the cities of the, the Levites are their possession among the children of Israel. But the, com, but the field of the common land of their cities may not be sold, for it is their perpetual possession. In our last area, we have the area of the urban. You got a year to pay it back. After that, you lose it. You have that of the rural. You will get it back, even if you can't Hey, before that point when Jubilee happens, you get the land back. As I remind you, this is your livelihood. This is your, if you will, this is your ancestral estate. <laughs> but then in regards to the ministerial, it's important to note that in Numbers 35, in Joshua 21, in 1 Chronicles 6, God tells us that he is assigning the Levites get specific property. Matter of fact, it'll tell us, I think it's in First Chronicles 6 and in Joshua 21, 48 cities are assigned to them. And God says, this is where you're going to live. And so if you, if they were, and by the way, how sad would it be that the servants of the Lord would ever be in a place where they'd have to start selling stuff just to be able to cover their, their bills. But he goes, but that property outside that's helping them, by the way, pay their bills, that if you will, the communal gardens that are attached to those, God says, that's never for sale. But if they have to, forfeit the house that's in a city, they get it back at the worst at the year of Jubilee. So let's close this whole thing up uh, so that we can bring it to prayer. First of all, the closer we get to redemption, again, the less important things of this world become. And first of all, may we recognize that the days are evil and that now our redemption is closer than it has ever been. And we are to rejoice that God has that for us. Second, this earth is his, and he can do with it what he likes, and what he chooses to do with it, by the way, is actually be kind with the property, and even restore property. And I love that idea, that God's like, even if you've been dumb, that doesn't mean I can't restore it to you. If you're willing to turn to me, I will restore you. And that will be chapters in the book of, of Deuteronomy, where God's like, if you're going to be dumb, the results are going to be ugly. But in those results, if you finally turn to me, I'll restore you back. You just need to turn with your whole heart. But I did want to point this out. Back to the sort of metaphor, if you will, of us living in this house, which is an, it's a reality for us, but in regards to the text. And if we were to then, let's say we couldn't afford it and we wind up subletting this to somebody else, but in the end of it all, they become these horrible tenants. We have no authority to kick them out, but the landlord does. And if the landlord wanted to remove somebody who had, if you will, either squatted on the property or somehow had been invited in and now is a guest that will not leave, there was a simple process culturally that needs to take place. To this day, it takes place in the Middle East. <laughs> First, you have to prove the ownership. You have to prove that you own the, the property if you're going to kick them out. Second, you have to make a public declaration at the gate to let everyone know that they're going to be evicted. And of course, that usually shows up as a sign on the door and such, as you, many of us have seen in some of the cities. Then finally, once they are evicted, then they cleanse the property. And they cleanse the property. And the idea of it is, you might imagine, you call the movers, they get everything out, and you disinfect the heck out of the place. Why is that important? Because that's exactly what we see in the time of the Great Tribulation in chapter 6 through 19 in the book of Revelation. First, we have the seals judgment. And what the seals prove, 
is that God is the owner of this property. That's why when there was no one found, John begins to weep uncontrollably. He's like, well, now well, we're doomed. But once the seals are broken and the, the sealed judgments are poured forth, the next thing are the trumpet judgments. The trumpets are the declaration of the now that there is going to be this eviction. And then after the trumpets are the bowls and the bowls are the cleansing of the land for the ultimate, re, if you will, rededication to the Lord. And God, by the way, how well does he cleanse it? He cleanses it by giving us the Big Bang. And by the way, I'll, I'll make clear to you, I do believe in the Big Bang. I just think you have it. I just think that the scientists have it on the wrong end. I don't believe in a Big Bang at the beginning of existence, but I do believe in one here, that ultimately there will be a big explosion and even the elements will melt in the fervent heat. That's, by the way, what Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3. So let me close this up. That day is coming and it tells us, this is Peter speaking in 2 Peter 3.11, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire and the elements will melt with the fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. When you've read... Be that you've read it in Psalm 37, where it tells us in verse 10, Yet in a little while the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Of course, from which Jesus will pull from to tell us in Matthew 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Verse 5. And you think, yeah, but who wants this earth? It is good to know that you're not getting this one. We get a new heavens and a new earth. That's what the meek inherit. Isn't that great news? So hear me as we go to prayer. Romans 8, verse 21. Because creation itself will also be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation right now groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly awaiting the adoption, the redemption of our body. Our redemption draws near. And however much time you have left, are you going to live it in light of the Jubilee to come? Or are you going to bank that you're going to just get extra time in this hotel room? Because sooner or later, we're going to stand before God and there's no take backs. There's no second chances on this. But God really wants us to celebrate that he has made this right with us. And he's done so through the gift of Jesus Christ. So that as we cry out to him, believing he died on the cross, was buried and rose again, we could cry out to him, accept his forgiveness, because that's how it all starts. And in that, we become citizens of heaven. And that is our home now. And if you've not accepted that gift, I would love, I would love to lead you in a prayer right now. If you have, might I say, as you, we can clearly see things are wrapping up here. Let us be more careful what we hold valuable and to look less, with less importance to the things that are going to, the earth and all its passions are going to fade away. And as God comes to claim this for his own, may we celebrate as his own. And if you have said yes, then may we, as we see our brother and sister in need, seek to bless them because in obeying God, we bless his own. Will you pray with me, please? God, I thank you for this beautiful text. I thank you for what you've taught us in it. I thank you for how you've led us in it. And now, Lord, I just pray that you would move profoundly on us so that, God, today, we could really be people who obey you the way that you would want us to obey you. Oh Lord, please today, don't let us walk out of this as if somehow this was just information to entertain and not really be in a place where we'd be like, Lord, I want what you have for me in this. Lord, please let us be obedient. And in that we recognize you're gonna use us to bless each other. Please, Lord, give us a heart for your people that we could love them the way that they should be loved. And also, Lord, right now, 
if there be any who have not accepted your gift, would you now, Lord, now convict hearts and move now in this time? And if that's you, you want to pray with me, pray this prayer. God in heaven, I confess to you I am a sinner, but you love sinners, and you sent Jesus to die for sinners just like me. And Jesus died for me, was buried, and rose again. And you give me the dignity of choice, and I say yes, confessing Jesus is my Savior, my Redeemer, and my Ransom. I am yours now, in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved, if you've prayed that prayer today, I would really love to follow up with you, give you some tools and some things to help you grow. And if you've just simply prayed, oh Lord, just use me to bless your people. I'd love to know about that. And I'd love to be praying for you in that, in that room as well. Well, what do you say we end with a song? And I want to thank you for taking this hour with me. And I believe we're right on time. Would you sing along if you know it? And if you don't, give it a try anyways. I mean, you're in your own house. Who's going to think you're weird? Creator, Redeemer, my healer, you are. Waymaker, chain breaker, sin taker, you are. Let the redeemed of the Lord sing and rejoice. And shout for the victory you have won at the cross at the cross in that light. Lord, may we live in light of the forthcoming and eminent redemption. And may we seek to bless one another as you would call us to. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, beloved. Thank you for the privilege of being able to serve you another Sunday. And I just look forward to e-seeing you next week. God bless you.